we're very privileged to have at the very end of this annual meeting, which has been a l large reflection upon how well the world is cooperating and evolving as we see some big transformations in the world in terms of technology, geopolitics, environment, and society. I'm Rick Sammons, a Managing Director at the World Economic Forum, and this is a session that poses a provocative question, which is, is the West paralyzed? We have Kishore Mahubani, who's Senior Advisor and Professor in the Practice of Policy at the National University of Singapore, and Niari Woods, Dean of the Blavatnit School of Government, University of Oxford in the UK. And what I'd simply like to do is to dive right into uh, this question, taking a look at the West in particular, uh, see how well it is or is not adapting, and what uh, these two esteemed uh, experts who really bring a wealth of interdisciplinary perspective and experience on this issue, how they think uh, things are evolving, whether they're optimistic or pessimistic. And I'd like to start with you, Kishore. Do you feel that the West is indeed uh, paralyzed, or do you see some glimmers of uh, actual uh, progress and, if I might say, waking up to the challenges that are being expressed on the streets, but many other venues, including here uh, this week in, in Davos? Well, um, thank you very much, Rick, uh, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here with Ngari. We both have the privilege of being founding deans <laughs> of schools of public policy. Um, the, the sad answer <laughs> I have to give to you is that the West hasn't woken up yet. And as you know, I wrote a book uh, recently called Has the West Lost It? And the fundamental point I make in the book, and this is essentially the big fact that the West has got to grasp with, is that from the year one to the year 1820, for 1800 of the last 2,000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. So it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off and North America took off. But if you view the past 200 years of world history against the backdrop of the past 2,000 years of world history, uh, the past 200 years of world history have been a major historical aberration. Now all aberrations come to a natural end and that's what we're seeing happening right now. So in purchasing power parity terms, the number one economy is China, number two is United States, number three is uh, India, number four Japan. So no, not a single European economy is among the top four. But what is even more puzzling about the big change that has happened is that while a major transformation is, has been happening, especially in the last 30 years, the West chose to go to sleep at precisely the point when China and India woke up. Because there was an amazing historical coincidence. It was a historical accident. The, at the end of the Cold War, around 1990, the West became so triumphalist and believed that it had reached the end of history, to quote a very famous essay. And the feeling in the West, especially among the elites, was that, oh, we don't have to make any more, any more fundamental changes. We have arrived. We have succeeded. We are the top dog. We can just go on autopilot. And they did that in 1990 at precisely the point when China and India decided to wake up. So in the last 30 years of the spectacular growth of China, India, and indeed the rest of Asia, the West has been on autopilot. So the reason I wrote the book, Has the West Lost It?, is to tell the West, hey, please, wake up. You can no longer go on autopilot. And just as the Asian countries had to make fundamental structural adjustments to deal with this new world, the time has come for Western societies to contemplate fundamental structural adjustments. But it, as far as I know, not a single major Western leader has said, hey, now, it's, now, now the time has come to adjust to the rise of Asia, and how do we cope with it? That's what the West needs to do if it wants to get out of this paralysis. Nari, what's your perspective? So I have a more optimistic view, and I think it's, it's borne out by what we've seen in Davos over the last few days. Um, with three kinds of change that are really happening in the people assembled here, and I think out of those changes come 
some, some real pathways to solutions. And the first, the first is a recognition of how disconnected the world's elite are, not just in the West, but across the whole world. Uh, there's a sense that we've got lots and lots of data, lots of technology, and yet that is not telling us what to look at. That's just giving us lots of information. And I hear CEOs and government officials talking about the need to reconnect to the front line. And it's much more difficult than people think because you need deference of the expertise and wisdom and knowledge of people at the front line, even if they're less formally educated than you. You know, a taxi driver once said to me when I said I worked in a university, oh, you educated people know nothing because every time you're in a new situation, you think you understand it, so you don't look. You don't see, you, 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 you're not able to observe what's really going on. And there's some truth in that. And I hear a yearning to reconnect, to go to the front line, to hold town hall meetings, to get out on the street, to find out what the experience of people in communities in which companies are working and governments are operating. A second change that I see very clearly is a change in leadership. So, Everybody's pointing to the democracies which have elected, you know, somewhat alpha male leaders. And I think here there's a very interesting experience from the private sector where the alpha male has had his day and is now being exited. And a different kind of leader is being brought forward across the West's corporations. And it's a leader who is, you know, what we saw is that it's a, it's a leader who's more inclusive, who's more a coach, more empowering who's more focused on the culture of the organization that, that, that she or he is leading. Now, why has that happened? It's happened because of the performance of the alpha leaders. Those alpha leaders, it turned out, who surrounded themselves with other alphas, uh, did a great job in times of growth. But then, when there was a crisis, the fact that everybody at the, around them was the same meant they were less resilient. They were too short-term, they were too self-interested, too narcissistic. So what we've seen in the private sector might well happen in politics. I don't think we can prejudge it. The most important thing moving forward for the West is that in every democracy, the constitution is held to. In other words, it's, it's when, uh, when the upcoming upsurgent, um, some would call them populist leaders, take over. Let's see how they perform. We know they've got everything it takes, social media mastery, to win an election, but do they have what it takes to actually deliver? And when they don't deliver, will we be able to vote them out of office? That's the key question. So I think there's a new focus on constitutional limits, where are the red lines, how do we ensure that these newcomers, some of whom might well deliver and perform, and if so, they, they will win, hopefully, their next election, and if not, we certainly hope they won't. So I see that new leadership emerging first in the private sector and it might well emerge in governments. And then just finally, on cooperation. There's a new, there's a new take on cooperation which is taking people time to adjust to. It's a new balance between values and the high tone kind of moral veneer that Western leadership of world institutions has had with a recognition that underlying that are some powerful strategic interests and that other countries have strategic interests. So to quote a Davos participant, the United States has always been democratic at home and hegemonic abroad. China is hegemonic at home and democratic abroad. Okay, somewhere between those two is a balance between long-term strategic interests and not so much values as shared goals and purposes. And I see a real commitment across, and what's special about Davos is the way it's bringing CEOs, government leaders from the United States, Europe, Canada, but also from China, Russia, and other parts of the world from the Gulf, and finding some of those common purposes. And I think having a more sober discussion about how to accommodate each other's strategic interests, and therefore how to use the institutions that we've got, not for maximalist goals, but to provide the information, to provide the mechanisms and processes that will make that accommodation possible. So, Rick, though I see the West moving in a direction that means that it, it will solve these problems. Good, that's encouraging to hear. 
You know, um, Kishore has uh, suggested that what is essential here to move in that direction are serious structural adjustments, is the way you put it. Mm. And that, that notion resonates with me in the sense that um, in the heat of the 2016 campaign in the United States, right at the end of the primary season, what, what we saw was that, in fact, a majority of voters in both parties in the U.S. rejected the establishment candidate. And basically, it was a vote of no confidence in 20 years or so of the way the country had been run, particularly on the economic side. And at that time, that summer, I wrote a piece called Waking Up, mm -hmm. America's Once in a Generation Opportunity for Structural Economic Reform and Political Renewal. Mm -hmm. And, and the, it was, uh, the waking up notion was exactly what you emphasize, is that the, the establishment or the elites, what you might, might call them, in both parts of the political establishment in the United States needed to recognize mm -hmm that the model needs to be adjusted, as you suggest, fundamentally uh, in a change in the economic model to emphasize not so much growth, aggregate growth, which is the overall volume of activity and wealth in a country, the wealth of nations, if you will, but actually progress in living standards, which is related to growth, but is not the same thing. A living standards is a, medi a median concept. <coughs> Kishore, let me ask you, um, when you, articulate the, the notion that there needs to be some fundamental stru structural adjustment. Could you give us uh, an example or two of what you have in mind? Well, I can give you a very fundamental one. Uh, you know, one of the most shocking statistics uh, uh, of recent times, which I actually wrote about in a column called Trump, Macron, and the Poverty of Liberalism, is that there's only one major developed society where the average income of the bottom 50% went down over a 30-year period from 1980 to 2010. And that's the United States of America. The average income of the bottom 50% going down. And at the same time, the, you know, the, the, in terms of the share of income within the top 1% and the bottom 50%, the inequality went up from the amount of income the top 1% were getting was 41 times before in 1980, went up to 138 times in 2010. So there's been an incredible neglect of the bottom 50% of the society that has obviously happened. Now this obviously cannot be solved through tinkering at the, at the edges. It cannot be solved through taking, changing your leaders and so on and so forth. It has got to deal with a fundamental change in mindset where you actually first of all ask yourself, how did this happen? What were the fundamental structural forces that led to the bottom 50% having their average income going down over the past 30 years? And my structural answer is that the elites got it wrong when they only paid attention to John Rawls' first principle of justice, which is on liberty, and ignored his second principle of justice, which is on equality and taking care of the and you know, John Rawls' principle of indifference means that the most just society is the, is the more, where, the, where the bottom 10% are the best off. That's the most just society. Now that attention to the bottom 10%, the bottom 50% has gone from the mindsets. And so I think that the fundamental structural change that has to take place in, among these elites eh, is that they got to recognize that they are in the same boat as the bottom 50%. And they've got to figure out how is it that the share of income, right, well, it was so distorted over the last 30 years. And it wasn't the case, by the way, huh? in the 50s and 60s. And you remember right. the American middle class and how it was prospering and growing and feeling a sense of great hope for the future. That all disappeared. Now, it just didn't disappear by accident. It, it disappeared because unfortunately, the entire focus, uh, and, and this was shown, of course, in the reagan thatcher revolution or so, was, hey, let the markets work. The markets will create a wonderful results. You government, get out of the picture. The less government you have, the better off you'll be. Now, I actually believe, I agree, Amatya Sen, that for a society to succeed, you need the invisible hand of free markets 
and the visible hand of good governance. The visible hand of good governance has disappeared. You now got to, in a sense, decide that actually a, a, a strong, organized, well-run government is as important for a success of society as the markets. And you must have a government that's strong enough to regulate the markets, strong enough to ensure that there's no regulatory capture, strong enough to ensure that the elites don't get rent income, and therefore you create a more level playing field for the whole society. And if you don't have the, the strong, good governance, you will not get the structural changes. Again, what you say resonates. We, a couple of years ago here, put out uh, a, a, a revised policy framework mm -hmm. called the Inclusive Growth and Development uh, mm -hmm. Framework mm -hmm. and a, a new metric on alternative GDP, which is founded on this notion. Mm -hmm. Translating your term, terminology into the importance of institutions of various mm -hmm. types and various aspects of the economy, which have been left to wither in many Western countries over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the pathway to reinvigorating the effective income distribution system implicitly within the economy. It's a, bal a better balance of an understanding of political economy on the one hand and growth economics on the other. Nairi, this gets to uh, the role of government. Mm -hmm. You emphasize as, one of, as your second point, mm -hmm. constitutional red lines. Mm -hmm leadership evolving and getting a more nuanced understanding of its responsibilities in, in various domains. Could you reflect a little bit more on uh, particularly how you see leadership? I mean, you're, at a, you're in an academic uh, perch where you educate leaders. How do you see the, this, this rebalancing, if you will, of the concept of, of, of what an economy is for mm -hmm. and how you execute on that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I agree with, with, with um, Kishore that over the last 35 years, at least, um, people forgot the significance of the government as a referee in, in, in markets. And if we now look back, it's actually been a 35-year process of a majority of the population losing, losing their share of GDP losing what they saw as an entitlement. We three, I think, from what I know of my co-panelists, are all beneficiaries of an era and a time and, and government policy which was focused on equal opportunity through great education. So many people at Davos of our generation went to you know, state non-private schools, came up through a system which, which, which gave us an opportunity to flourish. And that has actually been stripped out of a lot of the OECD countries. And the next generation, when you ask them, have all got their children in a very different kind of school. And that's telling us about the waning of opportunity. Now, I say this because when scholars have looked at why we've seen this change, they've debunked the oft-held view by both politicians and private sector leaders that it's technology and globalization, that it's forces beyond our control, that somehow humanity is just shifting to more inequality. No, what the data shows us is it is got choices of governments that have made this change. It's government policies around labor markets, government policies around interest rates, government policies in the social sector, around health, around education. <coughs> and so democracies have slipped into a slightly vicious cycle where because the, the, schools are, the, the publicly funded schools are poorer, the public health system is poorer, the public transport system is poorer, so too parents don't want to risk that their children won't be able to afford private. And so you get this, this cycle where the society has become more and more separate, not just unequal, but more separate and more fragmented. That's an issue that the private sector cannot solve on its own. Now, what I've heard at Davos this week are companies in Britain, in the United States, starting to think almost as some of the extractives had to start thinking in some of the poorest countries of the world, which is starting to think, if we want to operate in this community, we need to know that this community has some kind of stability and order. We need the schools to work. We need the roads to work. We need the internet connections to work. And we can't we can't take those contingent liabilities on ourselves. We can't take responsibility for all that. We need the government to provide that. So for me, what's really interesting is the way the debate 
is going from companies saying, we need a social license to operate, and we need government to help us with that. And governments themselves need a license to operate. And established political parties and established political leaders have lost that license. Rick mentioned the United States, where most of the population voted for somebody who promised to, well, um, a major we won't go through the American system, but a majority in the Electoral <laughs> College represented people who wanted to break the system. Every, in every European election, the same has happened. The big majorities that the established centre-left and centre-right have always won elections have disappeared. If you think about Italy, if you think about the Brexit vote, if you think about the French election, we could keep going across, across Europe. It's the, those who promise to break the establishment that are winning elections in democracies. One reaction is to say, oh, it's populism. The populace need to be better educated. I disagree. I think that the populace are showing a rationality. They're looking at the fact that their children are not going to have more secure jobs, slightly better houses, and better education by working hard. And they're scared about that. And they're saying the system's not working for us. So I, I, that sounds like a pessimistic story, but I think my optimism lies in the fact that <coughs> there are very many leaders, including those here this week, who are looking very soberly at that reality and saying we have to move very quickly. We're on a model that doesn't work. It's not about saving globalization. It's about resetting capitalism so that a majority of people in countries where it's operating are prepared to play in that system and not try to break it. Resetting capitalism. What I worry about, uh, frankly, uh, in the halls here, but also in the, on the pages of media, is that very often the discussion uh, goes rapidly to, well, we have to help the losers of technological change and globalization more, meaning that we need to take a, another look at income distribution and fiscal transfers. Now, that is certainly part of the, of the answer here. But the discussion here today illustrates a point that we've been quite focused on here, is that there are, there are various domains of what we call institutional strength from the educational system to infrastructure that connects people to markets to the way the financial system works and how capital is diffused for real economy uh, investment and production and employment, the way labor markets work and are, are or not adapting to the changing nature of work. We identified 15 different domains of institutional strength and we benchmarked countries around the world on them. And I think the point is, that, you know, I, I'm not sure if I'm optimistic or pessimistic yet, mm -hmm. because I'm not sure the, the understanding of the crisis that you've so clearly rung the bell on, Kishore, mm -hmm. has migrated to the structural level, mm -hmm. to the, what you said, the resetting of capitalism mm -hmm. requires structural reform. It's a different type of structural reform than the one that we saw in the 80s and 90s, which helped mm -hmm. countries, including in your region, mm -hmm. when they got into a balance of payments pr uh, crisis. Mm -hmm and they had to basically do fiscal mm -hmm. austerity and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So last point, and then I'm gonna to go to the audience for questions. Um, hubris, mm. and you've written extensively about <laughs> hubris in the West. Mm. Um, the World Bank did a landmark study in the 90s called the East Asian Miracle. Mm. And it wanted to investigate how did they do it, not just mm. in terms of developing, but developing with social equity. They grew very fast, but brought the population along, particularly the East Asia tigers. Mm. And the conclusion is what the two of you, or the three of us mm. is talking about here, mm. is they wired in structurally mm. institutions and the role of government, along with strong market incentives mm. that allowed both growth and equity to occur at the same pace. With that, let me invite uh, 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 brief questions uh, from the room. If there are any, just please identify your affiliation when you do so. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> My name is Dana Ewert. I'm a global shaper from the Amsterdam Hubs so from the Netherlands. Um, so I'm wondering, you talk about like insecurity for jobs, uh, for people, uh, changing labor markets. Um, what do you think is good policy when it comes to platforms? Because we see a lot of discussions now on uh, platforms and the impact they have on, on the labor market. 
uh, we need to have a new set of um, uh, social contracts, um, uh, they argue. Um, so what should we do? Should we regulate them? Uh, should we ban them? Um, are they a good addition to our economy? Because they seem to be quite dominant in the new economic structure we have. So every human technology brings both great opportunity and great inequality. The, the invention of the plough several thousand years before Christ immediately resulted in, archaeologists can show us, in a shift from everybody having the same side house to some people having much larger houses and other people having smaller houses. And human history is about the ways that humans invent to kind of recreate, you know, you get to a tipping point where suddenly you have to recreate some kind of distribution of opportunity. And the fact that since ancient times we've got to where we've got to just shows that human beings do keep reinventing ways to do this. And we're at that point of reinvention at the moment. So these platform technologies are undoubtedly going to create new winners and losers. And then we're going to have to come to think about how we regulate them. Now what's interesting in history is that the private sector has always played a big role in this. If you look at the Industrial Revolution in Britain in the 19th century, it was factory owners who begged the government to bring in minimum standards because the race to the bottom wasn't serving their interests. I think there's, there's companies today that are starting to push governments to, to think about these issues so that they can do better but on a level playing field. Um, I think the more you know, equally vital is what happens to social media platforms and the ability of governments to command trust to do this. And there I think there is a, there is a real imperative for us to consider what part of that business is a publishing business and how do you actually regulate that publishing business. I think too few people realize that there is a freedom of expression in being able to post stuff on social media. But there's a second step, which is when social media companies decide to put that on steroids to push it to very, very many more users. That's an act of publication, the second bit. And when they do that, they need to be held responsible for the content. They cannot hide behind the fact that it's an algorithm because they wrote the algorithm. So I think platforms have those two sides. And again, I have confidence that humans, so long as we keep coming together face to face, that's what Davos is doing, so long as we keep coming to face to face, and so long as we keep connecting outside of Davos to other people and communities, that we will create solutions to these problems. We have very limited time left. Kishore, I'm gonna give you the last word. Mm. Well, Either I on this I, question I, or more generally. No, I, I would say that I completely agree with a fundamental point that Nari made that when you have a huge technological leap, you have major social impact. And I would say with the fourth industrial revolution, which I think the Davos World Economic Forum has done a brilliant job of highlighting, things are gonna change fundamentally in human society. It is now possible for companies to produce everything they want to produce with robots, and they don't need human beings anymore. So that therefore the question becomes, what's the role of human beings in, in, in the economy. And clearly, all the kind of concepts that we use, right? Trade unions can protect the incomes of workers. Trade unions will not work if you don't have jobs for the for trade unions. So clearly, you need a fundamental change in, in mindset. And here again, the fundamental point is that markets cannot resolve this. If you let the markets resolve this, the companies will do what is the lowest cost thing and employ more robots and less human beings. That's why you need government intervention saying, what are the larger, broader interests of society? How do we keep our people occupied? How do we give them a sense of dignity that comes with working? You know, it's not about welfare. It's not about just giving people money. It's about giving people an opportunity to grow and thrive and succeed as human beings. Now that requires a fundamental restructuring of the whole social and economic uh, contract that we've had for the past 100, 200 years. And, and therefore, the rebalancing and a resetting of capitalism is badly needed. That's a terrific way to end the session. A renovation of social contracts, particularly in the West, and there's a lot that can be learned from other parts of the world in this regard. Thank you very much. It's been a fascinating discussion, and a great way to end uh, a busy week. And uh, with that, the session is closed. <laughs>